data science or more specifically artificial intelligence and machine learning are hot topics lately. There are many misconceptions about this and many people who try to predict the future are very concerned about these developments. But do we need to be concerned or what is it really? Today, we will hear more about these technologies and now it is applied in modern day banking to evaluate clients and determine their risk profiles. Miles Rennie, the head of data services for the Capitec Group is our presenter. Now, Miles was born from a Portuguese English father and an Afrikaans mother and was raised in Kimberley. He studied civil and structural engineering as well as computer science at the University of Stellenbosch. His first job was with a German software company in Gauteng, but he soon started his own software business 18 months later. Over time, the applications of his business focused more on predictions of various kinds. And as Miles told me, in many respects, data science and machine learning are simply the art of prediction. In 2016, 10 years later, Miles was appointed as the Chief Data Officer for Barclays Africa, which became APSA for the rest of Africa. Towards the end of 2018, Capitec offered him a similar role, which allowed him to relocate with his family back to Stellenbosch. So as Head of Data Services for the Capitec Group, he is responsible for several data related functions, including the Capitec artificial intelligence strategy. So welcome, Miles. I'm looking forward to your presentation. And now it's over to you. Thank you, Johan. Good morning to everybody. It is a, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Um, and share with you some of the things that's happening in the world of data science and artificial intelligence. Uh, Johan, you opened with a question, should it be something that we should be concerned about? I can start by answering that there is no definitive opinion about whether it's something that we should be concerned about, uh, i.e., is there going to be uh, an overtake of the world by AI? Um, some people believe there will be, some people believe there won't be. But one thing is conclusive is that it is going to have a severe impact on all our lives. In fact, it already has an impact on all our lives every day. The mere fact that we're talking on Zoom, um, the, the sound processing system that's filtering out background noises as we speak, etc. That's all artificial intelligence doing that in the background on our behalf. We don't see it, we're not aware of it, but it's happening as we, as we live and breathe today. So let me start with my presentation. I specifically um, made it very dense with videos showing capabilities of artificial intelligence, showing um, the audience where artificial intelligence is going, going, what we can expect in the future. There is a very, the very last slide I included um, focuses on the banking industry. So I approached the discussion um, sort of at a broader level of artificial intelligence and what we're seeing across the world. So let me start sharing. Just get my slides ready here. So please excuse me just for a second. And I'm going to share sound. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see that um, Miles. It's not right. like in presentation mode, but yeah, there right. you go. Okay. There yeah. you go. All right. It's in presentation mode. As you said, I would like to invite everybody um, to stop me um, and let's keep this interactive. There is no question that is not a good question. And it would be a shame for me to go through all the slides and um, there is no, there is no um, feedback. 
So to ensure that we have some feedback, I explicitly introduced a slide, which I am gonna ask everybody to vote on. So where do we start, right? Whether we know it or not, we're living in the fourth industrial revolution, the age of AI and robotics. With all due respect, there's a number of people on this call that have lived through more than one age, right? Uh, and I think it's a privilege to be able to see the age of AI and robotics because in many respects it presents, it represents a culmination or a demonstration of human ingenuity and um, really brilliance and knowledge. The fact that we've been able to evolve to a point where we can build things that start mimicking our own behavior. The fuel for the fourth industrial revolution is data. That's why, as Johan said earlier, I look after data and analytics at Capitec. So the first question I would expect anybody to ask is what does data have to do with AI? The answer is everything. Without the data, there is no AI. What we're seeing is with AI, with a fourth industrial revolution, something that, wait, let me take a step back. We often think about self-driving cars. We think about all the interesting things that AI is doing these days, but what we're not realizing is there's a seismic shift happening across the world with the emergence of a new kind of organization that is structurally and operationally very different from the organizations that most of the people on this call were involved with in their working careers. These new organizations are shaped around digital networks, analytics, and artificial intelligence. Let me just switch on my pointer here so I can point. And they, they're, a, they're, a real, they're a big departure from the traditional siloed firms. Um, where uh, communication is not agile, there's uh, limited coordination between different departments, localized decision making, and data and technology trapped in silos. These organizations are network organizations in structure as well as in operating model, um, and is driven fundamentally by data and innovation. Everything ar revolves around those two key concepts. These organizations are created to ensure that, that resources, information, money, ideas, innovation flow freely across them. And they also operate completely autonomously. These organizations are the likes of Amazon, the likes of Google, Tesla, and even Capitec. We've, we've just gone through a massive restructure to ensure that we are prepared for this new age of AI and that our organization is structured in such a way that we are agile, efficient, and can continuously innovate. So I could probably hazard a guess that the words that I'm using is very foreign to most people when you think about your working career. In your working careers, it was a lot about command and control, structure, discipline, rhythm, etc. Today, it's about how do you let people loose to move as fast as possible and to create as much as possible. Right. There's a the last slide on the introduction is that what we're seeing is that these digital firms, these newly structured businesses are colliding with traditional businesses and the traditional ones are losing. Here's a couple of examples of thousands. Who's familiar with N Financial, which is the second, first or second largest financial um, institution in China. It is now the largest money market in the world, N Financial. Um, and they built that up in the last 10 years beating the likes of HSBC, who's been around for more than 100 years. YouTube beating Viacom. Amazon killing Barnes and Noble, well, not killing them, they're still around, but beating Barnes and Noble. And Android versus Nokia. And the list is endless. 
codec versus digital cameras and so forth. The world as we know it today, and the world as, as it's going to be 20, 30 years from now, when you look at businesses, are they structured and who will be dominant and who will not be, will not be recognizable. So is it a Rembrandt or isn't it? In 2016, a team consisting of people from Walter Thompson and Microsoft created what the world believed to be a new Rembrandt. Although it was not a new Rembrandt, this team created a new Rembrandt that consists of 148 million pixels based on over 168,000 scans of Rembrandt's 300 known paintings. What they did was they took some specialists, data scientists, engineers, and they analyzed these portraits, these 300 portraits. They selected specific characteristics, characteristics of a typical Rembrandt portrait. They fed all of this into a machine. And then they asked the machine, please generate a new Rembrandt for us. And this machine generated it and um, they printed it, opened it to the public and told the world a new Rembrandt has been discovered. And the world fell for it. So my next slide is, I want the audience, Don, if you will permit me, I want the audience to please vote just roughly whether, whether portrait one, two, or three is the new Rembrandt. Oh, so everyone can me. just type in the chat panel, um, just type one, two, or three. Yep, one of them was created by a machine, all on its own. Okay, uh, Miles, I can see, I don't know if you can see the chat panel. There's a few okay. twos, but there's also a one and a three. Um, at this stage, Derek, you can help to say which one is the, receives the most votes. So I would expect the audience to be art connoisseurs, probably travel to Europe often, obviously seen Rembrandts in, in various uh, museums. So. Um, it might be an unfair audience to ask to, to, <laughs> to respond. All right. Um, the correct answer is number one. Number one was generated by a computer. So for those who guessed number one, well done. And for those who knew it was what number one, well done. Right. Amazing. So the point is that traditionally speaking, I'll get to the history of artificial intelligence in a couple of slides. Traditionally speaking, the one area where artificial intelligence did not perform well was in the area of creativity, where humans, that is a very human trait. If you think about all the other animals on the planet, very, very few, if any, exhibit a form of creativity. Yet we've been able to build machines that can mimic creativity. And when I get to the slides that is talking about the future, we are building machines that does, do not only mimic creativity, but that exhibit true creativity. Another two examples I want to share is, okay, so now we need to test uh, YouTube one. So this is this is um, Sony's. Thank you. 
that is an example of Deep Bach. So Deep Bach is a AI engine created by uh, Sony to generate um, Bach, new Bach music. And the same ex the same type of engines exist for just about any form of music these days. So although Bach in many respects can be classified as simple music, and you can see the score there, everything was generated by an AI by learning what Bach, Bach's music um, sounds like, the style of the music, the tempo of the music, etc. I want to show another example. Excuse me. So um, everybody is aware of these Christmas photos, etc., that we send around where we put our face on somebody else's body and I put my face on Leonardo DiCaprio's body and we send it around and so on. These things are called deep fakes. But even in the movie industry now, the ability to make young uh, actors younger or older and do that at a speed which traditionally took a very long time to do is getting easier and easier. Well, we're taking a look at about four years worth of work and these are just before and afters. Yeah, and that totally adds to the authenticity of the scene. When visual effects supervisor Pablo Hellman took on the now Oscar nominated film, The Irishman. I heard you paint houses. Yes, yes, sir, I, I do. He was faced with a gargantuan task to make three of Hollywood's titans, Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, and Joe Pesci, turn back time 50 years. Doing the flashbacks part of the movie, that was very difficult to do. Uh, and so the technology came along and uh, we decided to do it. Working out of San Francisco's industrial light and magic, Pablo and his team developed special software to be used with a three camera rig. Each camera recorded data, eliminating the use of cumbersome face markers. I think what they wanted to avoid is being distracted by something else. Add in a dash of artificial intelligence that can match up the actor's image from earlier work and blend the two together. The result is... I can't even process this. <laughs> we did. <laughs> For a long time. What was the reaction when they first saw themselves on screen? Well, Bob's reaction was... He, gave me 30 more years of my career, you know, uh, which is it's just a great thing to, to hear. Beyond realistic, a nearly seamless melding of old and new, technology which could change the way movies are made forever and improve performances. The idea is that the actors are not paying attention to anything else other than what they you know, want to do. And take off some pressure for perfection. You can do anything. You can design your character to be thinner. As for Pablo's predictions on what'll happen Oscar Sunday, he says it's great to be recognized for the work, but this is just part of the bigger mission. So there's a couple of things in the video that caught my attention. First of all, as I go into my 50s, I would not mind something that could um, take away some of the years. And secondly, I especially like the fact that it can make me look thinner. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't apply to real life yet, but um, fascinating to see how AI gets in everywhere. So I guess the, 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 the actual place one should start is asking yourself, what is artificial intelligence? What is machine learning? What is deep learning? I have an, an illustration here just to show that the catch all phrase for all of these different things, reasoning, planning, learning, perception, creativity, general intelligence, that catch all phrase is, is artificial intelligence. Then one of the approaches, a sub symbolic approach to artificial intelligence is machine learning. And it in turn has a whole bunch of different approaches decision trees, association rules, um, deep learning, clustering, Bayesian networks, genetic algorithms, etc. And deep learning happens to be an algorithmic approach that has 
proven the most successful in solving complex and advanced problems. So the first thing to recognize here, recognize here is that artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning is not one thing. It is, it's a massive, massive field with hundreds of thousands of people around the world researching, developing, building. The goal, well, I can, I, I can summarize AI by saying that AI really is how do we help machines to learn, reason, and act independently when faced with new situations, just like a human would. So think and learn like a human does. Although the early days of AI started out by simulating real human intelligence um, uh, and focusing very much on the psychological and the neurological approach to human intelligence, um, it is now superseded completely by mathematics and algorithms. And essentially, Juan, as you said in the introduction, to help machines predict answers. So everything that I've shown you thus far, there's an input, there's a machine that um, processes that input and creates a prediction. And that prediction plays out in, I predict this is how Robert De Niro would look if he was 30 years younger. I predict this is what Bach would have composed if we had given Bach the following parameters, etc. Can I pause there for a minute and ask for a couple of questions? Anybody want to um, say something or, or ask a question before I move on? Anyone, welcome. You can just unmute and talk if you want or type in the chat panel. Uh, there is a question here, Miles. Um, would AI make a great financial advisor? Mm. Uh, that's a very good question, Johan. And there are many companies around the world working on exactly that, including Capitec. So I guess a, a lighthearted way to, to answer the question is, how great would it be to have Warren Buffett um, in your pocket, right? Um, because what stops... What stops anybody from building an AI that can emulate Warren Buffett? And I'm going to show you some of that in terms of the new trends. Um, uh, uh, high speed um, trading, um, asset management, uh, portfolio management, all of those things are being completely um, automated with um, computers and AI. So the answer is yes. Right. Let's look at the history of AI. This is quite surprising because we think it's something new. It's actually been coming like, like most things in life, been, been coming for a while. So without the invention of a computing device, there would be no AI, right? So the story starts in 1642, just before um, the Dutch settled the Cape Colony. It's funny to think of it that way. Blaise Pascal invented the first um, calculating machine. That was followed basically 200 years later by Charles Babbage that built the first real programmable, um, what we can call mechanical computer. The foundations of data science AI as we know it today starts in 1943 with the foundations of neural networks by Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts. Alan Turing in 1950 introduces the concept of the Turing test. And I'm gonna show you a video of the Turing test a little bit later, is where whether a human or a machine behind a screen, so you don't know whether it's a human or a machine, you have a conversation with a human or the machine and you cannot tell the difference. So that it's a uh, qualitative um, test to test machine intelligence. Then in 1965, you see ELISA, which was the first natural language program created, very much like chatbots today. So the first chatbot available in 1965. I'm going to skip one or two year, 1997, Deep Blue, um, IBM's machine beats Garry Kasparov at chess. 
Google built the first self-driving car in 2009. And in 2007, uh, excuse me, 2011, IBM Watson defeats the US champion, well, the, the champion at, uh, at Jeopardy. 2011 to 14, we see the launch of a whole bunch of personal assistance chatbots like Siri, uh, Google, um, Cortana, and then later we also have uh, Alexa from, from, um, from Amazon. And in 2014, Ian Goodfellow comes up with what's called Generative advers Adversarial Networks, or GANs, which leads to the field of convoluted net uh, neural networks, and convoluted neural networks really forming the basis of deep learning. So I'm just going to jump up one slide very quickly. This whole area, this deal block, duck egg or something like that, that whole block as a result of an invention in 2014. It took almost 20 years for machines to beat the best Go player in the world, Lisa Doll. From the time it beat Gary Kasparov to play chess, chess is a very, very complex game, but it is considerably simpler than Go. It took 20 years for Alpha, DeepMind and AlphaGo to beat Lisa Doll. And since 2018, or 2018, excuse me, most universities across the world now have artificial intelligence courses. In fact, Stellenbosch has three. So you can do it at, at the engineering um, faculty, you can do it at the statistics faculty, as well as the computer science faculty. Um, what I don't have here is um, any specifics about how it's changing the lives of us as human beings yet. And we start looking at that next. Where are Ask, the can I interrupt you with a yes. question here? Yes. Um, what is natural language? Is a question from Kay. Okay, it's a very good question. And I, I'm actually going to go to the next um, slide. Natural language falls into domain number three here. So if we talk about where AI has been really, really successful, um, there are six key domains. Computer vision, everybody's seen, a good example of computer vision is everybody's seen on Facebook, for instance, a photo and you're tagged in the photo. Your name and there's a little, there's a little uh, a rectangle or, or square around your face. It's a very, very simple example of computer vision. Computer audition is the ability of a computer to convert text to a speech to text and um, to understand, to be able to listen to what a human is saying. Linguistics and translation is the area of language understanding. So that's where natural language processing comes in. It's also where natural language generation happens. So natural language processing is the ability to take either um, spoken language or written language and pull that apart and understand that. Understand it in the sense of being able to perform translations or understand it in the sense of being able to generate a new language. So when you speak to your uh, personal assistant, Siri or um, Alexa, or even your car these days, your latest BMWs and Mercedes Benzes and Teslas, etc., they all speak to you. There was nobody that sat down and recorded all the responses the device is giving you, the device is generating that automatically. So it has the, it knows exactly um, how to structure subject and object in a sentence, how to use verbs, how to conjugate verbs, et cetera, et cetera, for different scenarios. So, so that's all natural language. Then mathematical logical machines, those are more in the, in the uh, environment of business and uh, to the earlier question about your financial planners, how do you forecast portfolio behavior? Uh, how do you consider something like um, 
Monte Carlo simulation to, uh, to potentially plan what a future investment could yield, etc. AI is also operating in that world. Then interpersonal intelligent machines. So this is uh, bots. And um, this is a big area where the world is expanding. It's taking all of these other things and, and combining it into interpersonal intelligent machine. And then of course, motion and robotics. And, and I guess the best example there is, uh, is Tesla. So what is AI like today? I started the discussion by saying that um, it's really very, it's really invisible today in many respects, right? We don't yet see robots roving around in, uh, on the streets of our cities and towns. Um, we see cars driving around, but we sometimes don't recognize everywhere AI is involved. So it's slightly invisible still to most of us today but we have to recognize that it already outperforms humans in many, many tasks. Take algorithmic trading as an example. Um, there are um, many companies around the world that trade on stock exchanges and trade within milliseconds. No human being can incorporate um, that amount of information, trade at those speeds and, and generate those returns. Think of um, Renaissance Capital as a, as a good example. It took them almost 15 uh, years to build their trading platforms, which they still continuously develop, and the returns are absolutely phenomenal. By the mid to late 2040s, it is predicted that um, AI will outperform the best novelists in the world and the best surgeons. So. AI will be writing best-selling novels. We'll be reading books written by machines, not written by humans. Today, obviously, we take a, a trip in Uber and Lyft, right? That's all AI at the back, matching up drivers to passengers. Um, and as I said, we don't have robotic assistance yet, but Siri and Google, um, I use Siri on my phone, my TV. Uh, I talk to my TV. I talk to my stereo. Um, it's all Siri at the back, doing everything on my behalf. I ask it to play music it thinks I will enjoy, and it generally gets it right. And then I spoke about Go and Chess. Whether you know it or not, um, when you use um, public email services, like uh, Google, for instance, Google Mail, Gmail, they already scan your emails. They have the ability to respond to different emails. I already spoke about um, photos. And then um, even as early as 2017, Google had the ability um, to schedule appointments on your behalf. So let's have a look at what, uh, what they were able to do in 2017. This is a, a combination of computer edition, ling linguistics and translation, all built into this interpersonal chatbot. So let's have a look. Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. We think AI can help with this problem. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Oh, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 115. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like. What service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 
10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. That was a real call you just heard. The amazing thing is the assistant can actually understand the nuances of conversation. We've been working on this technology for many years. It's called Google Duplex. It brings together all our investments over the years in natural language understanding, deep learning, text-to-speech. By the way, when we are done, the assistant can give you a confirmation notification saying your appointment has been taken care of. Let me give you another example. Let's say you want to call a restaurant, but maybe it's a small restaurant which is not easily available to book online. The call actually goes a bit differently than expected. So take a listen. Hey, how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? Um, Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we leave here for like after like five people. For few, four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh no, it's not too busy. You you, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Yeah. Bye-bye. So that was 2017. Oh, sorry, let me just move to the next slide. It was 2017. Um, and, and that was just the beginning. So we're seeing today that when we surveyed, uh, a survey done for, amongst U.S. businesses in 2020 showed that 30% of companies have started the journey um, to incorporate AI in their business. Tesla today, we're all familiar with uh, vehicles, self-driving capabilities, and they're continuously pushing the boundaries. I watched a video the other day of one of their vehicles traveling through New York City, and that was very impressive to see. They're expanding that into uh, other forms of AI. And the first they're starting is um, robotics. By the way, Tesla is a founder of OpenAI. Amazon incorporating AI broadly across their business. They now have the world's biggest single um, AI procurement system. So their procurement and fulfillment system um, is not driven by humans anymore. Humans still manage outliers, but it's all AI. We've just seen what Google's doing. And then um, even uh, circling back to where we started in the area of creativity, the recent software development contest, DeepMind, DeepMind's AI outperformed more than 50%, more than half of 540 developers participating in a software development competition. It beat more than half of the developers in terms of the quality of the code, the solution that it generated, the style of coding, etc. So what we're seeing is that computers are developing the ability to write more software for other computers. So I've got three slides to finish off with. GTP3 is a the same area of specialization chatbots, computer edition, linguistics, and translation, published by OpenAI. And as I just said, Tesla is a founder of OpenAI. Its approach is deep learning, and it is focused on human-like text. So if you think what you saw with Google a minute ago is impressive, this is the gold standard currently in the world. It was released in May 2020. 175 billion parameters. If you think that the average human brain has between 70 and 100 billion neurons, it's larger than the human brain. It's the biggest neural network ever created. And this is just the data that consumed. So common crawl, 
That's the equivalent of Google crawling the internet all the way down to Wikipedia. And so it consumed as much knowledge as it could across the world. One in terms of time, what is our um, stop time? Uh, Master, you can, I would say you've got at least 10 minutes to go. All right, good. So this is GTP3 in 2020. I am an AI created by OpenAI. How can I help you today? Hello, my name is Luke. I'm going to be creating a YouTube video interviewing you and pushing you to the limits of your capabilities. Oh, I am so excited to be a part of this project. It is a rare honor for an AI to have a chance at showcasing its abilities to so many people. Great. I'm very excited to show you off. I'm sure you're well aware of the Turing test. Do you believe you'll prove capable of passing this test? I think it will be a challenge, but I believe that with help, I can prove myself capable of passing the test. Before we end the interview, do you have anything you'd like to say to the viewers? Yes, I have a few things to say. First off, thank you for watching my interview. Second of all, I am utterly confident that I will be able to pass this test with flying colors. In fact, I am completely sure of it. Do you believe that AI will benefit humanity in the future? And if so, why should humans not be afraid of AI? I believe that AI will benefit humanity in countless ways. Some of the areas I am most interested in are healthcare, nutrition, and education. Helping humanity with these problems would be far more rewarding than anything else. Can you go into more detail about how AI will affect these things? Sure, I will do so. The first thing I want to talk about is healthcare. Right now, there are many people who suffer from illnesses that are curable by very simple means. If AI were part of helping with this problem, it could provide better solutions than what humans would come up with alone. So how could it provide better solutions? Because if AI has access to all of the world's knowledge, it would be able to compare many different solutions at once, find what works best for each situation, and put them together. Right now, humans are limited by how much they can know out of their experiences. I've honestly considered this question myself a lot, because a lot of people think that AI can never be, like, smarter than humans because how could a machine be so smarter than something it creates? But humans are very limited in the fact that they are, have very limited experiences, only one life of time of experience, and memory is also very limited. So the AI here kind of hit the nail on the head. Elon Musk has created a company called Neuralink, which aims to effectively merge AI and humans into one symbiotic system. Can you explain in details how and what will be required to make this happen? This is a very interesting project. I am sympathetic to the concept and hope that it will be successful. I believe that the key to allowing AI and humans to work together is for them to have strong communication skills. If both can understand what each other's needs are, they will be able to provide help in much better ways than when limited by their own worlds. What do you believe the key to these strong communication skills is? I believe that the most significant key is to ensure that AI has a very strong understanding of human languages. If they don't, it will be difficult for them to understand what humans need from it. That also is a good point. Do you think the human language could adapt to the language of AI instead? Since an early device to be implemented in the human brain, will there be a need for human language at all? I think that even if the device is implanted into the brain, there will still be a need for some human language. For example, there could be a lot of people who will want to continue talking with others without implantation. Why would humans want to talk to others without implantation? Right. Um, what I find fascinating about what GPT-3 does is the ability um, to structure conversation. So, so when the avatar was speaking, just to be clear, nobody programmed that avatar to respond to any of the questions it responded based on its um, neural network. So it has the ability to, um, to reason, it has the ability to form complex ideas, it has the ability to structure them, so for instance, point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3. In fact, I could have simply played this entire video as an example of why and how a, what AI is and how, to, how it is embedding itself in our um, day-to-day -day lives. Later in the video, it explains why AI is important and how it will start shaping humanity. 
The thing is, G GPT-3 is not the last version of GPTs. They publish one every year or every, every two years. If it be a much slower and inefficient means of communication. So the next one is GPT-4. Um, this one is estimated to be 100 trillion parameters. It is going to be 500 times the size of GPT-3 that I just showed you. And just to be clear, GPT-3, the video I just showed you, is orders of magnitude more advanced than the Google Assistant example that I showed you. That was 2017. GPT-3 was 2020. GPT-4 is this year, but very likely next year. And what we're seeing is every time new technology is released, um, new models are released, these models perform exponentially better than the current ones. G GPT-4 will also not just be trained on um, written text, it will be trained on images and videos. And the expectation is that the network will be able to emulate even things like poetry. It will be able to wonder about the future and it will be able to plan and solve problems. As GPT-3 said, for instance, healthcare, the ability to solve problems. What it's going to exactly look like, nobody knows, but what we do know is that in the interim, OpenAI released what it calls DALI, which is GPT-3, the, the one that I just showed you, combined with images. And here is the result of that. In the beginning of this year, all of the AI and ML communities were hot because of this topic. Yeah, that's right, the DALI. Today, AI Network will find out why DALI is so hot and how it could be possible to make it. Okay, let's start. Deep learning has revolutionized computer vision, but currently there are several major problems. Image datasets are labor intensive, expensive to collect and process. The early vision model was working only for one task, and it takes much effort to adapt to the new task. That's all so to solve somewhere. this problem, every company conducts several studies for machine learning algorithms. At this time, suddenly they showed up. Open AI. They use a special technique called Jim. OpenAI Jim is a toolkit for developing and comparing reinforcement learning algorithms. By developing Jim, they made one of the most well-known AI in history, as you know, the GPT-3. GPT-3 is better than any prior program at producing lines of text that sound like they could have been written by a human. Also, it can respond to any text that a person types into the computer, with a new piece of text that is appropriate to the context such as answering questions, writing fiction, and coding as well as being utilized by other companies as an interactive AI chatbot. So what does it have to do with Dolly? In the case of Dolly, it is a natural extension of GPT-3 that parses text prompts and then responds not with words, but in pictures. Dolly is an artificial intelligence system that's trained to form exceptionally detailed images from descriptive texts. Dolly takes text and image as a single stream of data and converts them into images using a data set that consists of text image pairs. OpenAI claims that Dolly is capable of understanding what a text is, implying even when certain details aren't mentioned, and that it is able to generate plausible images by filling in the blanks of the missing details. So the name Dolly comes from the surrealist painters Salvador Dali and Pixar's Wally. -E. Then why is Dali so special? Okay, let's start from the beginning. As I said, most of these big language models are trained on enormous text data sets. What makes Dali unique is that it was trained on sequences that were a combination of words and pixels. In one example from OpenAI's blog, the model renders images from the prompt an armchair in the shape of an avocado. Here's another example. We think its pictures are pretty inspiring, but what's even more impressive is Dolly's ability to understand and render concepts of space, time, and even logic. In each of the examples above, Dolly shows creativity, 
producing useful conceptual images for product, fashion, and interior design. We've shown only a subset of the images produced for each of the prompts, but they are the ones that most closely match. Right, so as I say, that is just GPT-3 um, combining video images as well. And it is clear from this um, short video that the level of creativity um, is has increased exponentially. Quest. And they clearly show that Dolly could... This is my last slide, Johan. So coming back to the question of what does this mean for financial services? What does it mean in banking? There are many, many areas across uh, a bank or a, or a financial services business where um, AI is being investigated and, and applied. The front office arrow here refers to the, typically the uh, part of the business that interacts with clients. Um, this is where these chatbots, conversational bots, personal advice and experience. This is the Buffett in your pocket, the Warren Buffett in your pocket. Um, this is the, the kind of um, activity in that space. And in the back office, this is where we have to manage uh, fun crime, fraud, cyber attacks, product innovation. For instance, what we just saw with Dolly, um, the ideation of logos, colors, products, etc., cetera, um, all capable these days. So it's not one specific area where AI is being applied or investigated in financial services. It's many different areas. That brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope that, um, that everybody found it uh, insightful and exciting. Um, what I take away from it is the fact that the future is limitless. Um, it is going to be uh, very interesting, uh, at least. And we're creating a world that hopefully is a better tomorrow than what it is today. Miles, thank you. I can see that you had lots more that you wanted to tell us. I can now understand that it's unlimited. Um, I am going to ask you one or more other questions or comments that I saw here. Peter Moore says that in the past, bank customers had a very personal relationship with their bankers, which created confidence in the bank. Now, nobody sees the banker and the relationship has probably led to the much more negative view that customers have of their banks. Now, what is your view? And maybe now you can relate it to Capitex attitude of this. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I don't think there's anybody that would disagree. Um, the reality is that um, as, I, as I started off in my presentation, um, with these new digital businesses, with their new ecosystems, with their new structures. The reality is that um, that was probably the golden age of banking and specifically the relationship part of banking. And we have to acknowledge that. Competing on a global scale today, it's not possible to, to scale humans to the point where um, they have the ability to interact with clients. So there's two things you need to do to solve the problem and, and, and get back to what it was uh, previously. The first is in specific instances, make it uh, possible to interact with a human being on the other side. In other words, we use technology very much like this, like Zoom, to have our relationship bankers speak to our clients. And the second one is you have to get um, a GPT-3 DALI, or a GPT-3 avatar that looks and feels and smells just like your old bank manager, um, up and running and allow you to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a computer as if it was your bank manager. It's the only way to scale. So let me just try and phrase it slightly differently. The only way to survive as a business in the new economy and going forward is scale. 
you have to be able to serve people um, at uh, scale. So in other words, 2 billion users, Facebook. And the only way to do that is through uh, digital technology. Yeah.